Welcome. Welcome to the museum. No, we're so we're so glad you're here. And and um, I have so many thank yous. I will be quick. But first of all, thank you to Wilson Baim, our manager of engagement for all the parts and pieces to Jody Salter of the Walker Institute of International Studies. We this this was her brainchild and um, bringing in the artist Irina Nakava. This is such a huge thing. We couldn't have done it without the Walker Institute as a wonderful partner, the Columbia World Affairs Council. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And could I ask any sponsors? I know you're here tonight. I've seen your faces. Any sponsors of the exhibition to please stand up and, and get a round of applause? Thank you. And I know there are more shy ones out there, so thank you, too. We couldn't do what we do without you. So um, without further ado, I'm going to just introduce the moderator this evening, and then he will introduce the other panelists. And... Um, He's a moderator this evening because he has a very long CV, so I'm just going to give you the highlights, which are exciting. <laughs> so Joel Samuels uh, became interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina in January of 2021. Dean Samuels previously served the university in a variety of posts, including professor of law, executive director of the Rule of Law Collaborative, and interim vice provost for interdisciplinary studies. Because... He worked extensively in Russia in the early 1990s on efforts to combat organized crime, and he was an observer of the Russian Constitutional Assembly in 1993. In addition, he's been a contributor to several Russian newspapers, including Literaturnaya Gazeta and magazines and a variety of um, other publications. Uh, Dean Samuels received his um, AB, magna cum laude, in politics from Princeton in 1994, and he received certificates in Russian studies and European cultural studies and was awarded several prizes. Um, so he knows he's, a, he's our perfect moderator for this evening, so I will turn it over to Dean Samuels. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all so much for being here. Out of an abundance of caution, we're all going to continue wearing our masks, even though we're somewhat distant. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to hear us all right, and we'll do our best to enunciate. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Columbia Museum of Art for this partnership, one that is longstanding with not only the College of Arts and Sciences, but the university in general. And as I was telling Della earlier, one that we hope to expand in the college in the coming months and years. And we're going to work very hard at the university to be very intentional, very strategic, particularly in the College of Arts and Sciences about our engagements across the community. We just added a new director of external relations who started for the first time today. And we're thrilled for, for that role to not only focus on our alumni relations, but really on engaging our community locally here in Columbia and across the state. So um, I look forward to many more programs like this. I also, when I was reviewing the list, List of attendees tonight saw a number of members of our faculty and in the College of Arts and Sciences in the art uh, in the School of Visual Art and Design and across the college. And I'm thrilled to have so many uh, members of our college here to support this event and to support engagement with the community uh, as well. I also want to uh, thank the Walker Institute, Jody Salter, Josh Grace from, from the Walker Institute for International Air and Area Studies for their efforts in putting on this event, for bringing ARENA down, and, uh, and also the World Affairs Council for its support of this visit. Uh, this is really a special occasion for me uh, on many levels, but primarily because we have here with us three individuals who have really had very different but important formative experiences in what was then the Soviet Union in the period that we'll be talking about in our life underground uh, discussion today, which we're going to try to really do in a conversational style. But we're going to really focus on the 1970s and 80s and particularly the 80s as, as uh, the Soviet Union evolved and particularly during the Gorbachev years and the Glasnost period, when uh, individuals were living almost dual lives, and artists were, but others were across across the Soviet Union uh, during that period, uh, professional life during the day uh, under certain constraints, and then uh, a life at night where you were doing other other kinds of things. And so, I'd like to briefly introduce our three uh, panelists tonight, and uh, and I'll start, of course, with our our guest star, who's come down all the way from, as we say in Russian, no Novaya Jersey, New Jersey. <laughs> Uh, where Irina splits time between Moscow and New Jersey, where she lives. Uh, and uh, Irina Nakova uh, has uh, been an artist for really all her life, but in many different forms, in traditional forms, painting and others, but really is best known as an installation artist. And as you know uh, from visiting our, our amazing e exhibition, 
Uh, she uh, has one of her pieces here, part of a larger uh, piece that was originally produced with nine cots, but it's the cot is the piece that you'll see here. Uh, and we have a few slides that will rotate. This is the main one behind me, but you'll have uh, the slide of the cot behind us at times tonight, and also of one of her most famous installations from uh, known as the, the Rooms. And uh, this is the cot behind us right now. And then if we could just show the rooms and we can again rotate among them, which was really a unique piece. It was a, the first total installation in Russian art yeah, located in her own Moscow apartment, the same apartment where she still lives today. And it was really a unique and transformative piece. She's a part of what's known, come to be known as the Moscow Conceptual School. And she's really been a, a trailblazer in both her art, but also in the engagement of what we're going to be talking about tonight, art society, community, and related spaces. Our second participant tonight is Dr. Gordon Smith. Uh, Gordon and I have a long history. He's a large part of why I joined the University of South Carolina 17 years ago. I won't go into that. I will just say he's held almost every role one can hold, many of which I've held. He was the founding director of the Rule of Law Collaborative. I succeeded him there and what he, at the time, referred to. Do you remember what you referred to it as? A Putin Medvedev switch. <laughs> And then uh, served, among other things, as interim dean of the College of Liberal Arts. So, uh, but but above all, Gordon is uh, is one of the foremost scholars uh, of Russia of his time, and particularly of the procuratura, of the procuracy, of the prosecution service uh, in the Soviet Union, and was largely known as the foremost American expert on the pro procuracy uh, for many many years, and continues to be sought out for advice uh, on that issue. But but covered a range of issues in his scholarship, publishing. Uh, hundreds of articles, dozens of books, and really uh, a, a foremost scholar of political science in Russia, also a former director of the Walker Institute. We're thrilled to have Gordon here. And oh, we didn't, we didn't applaud Irina. I guess we should applaud everyone. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a valedictory. And finally, uh, Dr. Elena Osokina. Uh, Dr. Osokina has been at the university uh, for a number of years. And one of the things that I, I remember when she first moved here, we, when I first took over uh, in January and she, we had our first conversation, she said, you won't remember me. And I said, I absolutely remember you because when you were moving here, your, your moving truck got into an accident and all of your life belongings were splayed out across the highway. It's, it's an unforgettable experience. <laughs> Um, Dr. Osokina is an interesting story. She was complete, she completed two dissertations because upon completing her first dissertation focused on Imperial Russia in the late 1980s, at that very moment, archives were being opened for the first time. And she took that opportunity to do a second dissertation focused on the Stalin era and focused specifically on the black market and uh, a range of issues where she became a leading expert. And just today, she brought me her most recent book. So I'm doing a little advertising of her most recent book called Stalin's Quest for Gold, which is looking at a particular type of, a type of uh, what are known as hard currency shops and Soviet industrialization. So in other words, you would, uh, you would, and I would welcome if you want to take a look at it later, an opportunity opportunity to do that. But what, 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 what her research does as a historian is it intersects society, industry, government, politics, and shows those intersections, art. And so I think what we have today are three outstanding experts to talk to us a little bit about life underground in the 1980s in uh, Moscow, the Soviet Union, and beyond. So I'd like to start, if I could, um, Irina, by asking you, uh, how did that period as an artist, impact you as a person? In other words, how, how was the intersection between your work, your personal experience, your social experience, how did that play out during the course of the 1980s? Uh, I started as an artist uh, in the early 70s, and it's my um, work spans over 50 years almost right now. So... Uh, I guess I am present here as a relic of Soviet times in some ways, but I am still working and I'm still alive. So, and the memories come back to me because, uh, right now, as you know, I'm going back and forth in between my New Jersey, uh, existence and Moscow existence. So, uh, all the memories from the seventies and eighties are coming back in the Putin's era because we are going back to the so-called, um, kitchen culture when people and friends are assembling in the apartments and, uh, not going anywhere or, 
uh, because it's impossible. As you know, what's going on right now with Russian politics, it's really going back in the Soviet times. And uh, so I guess I, I lived through it. So it's nothing uh, unusual for me, nothing new for me. It's just very sad to come back to this kind of... Um, withdrawn from um, society, let's say, culture, because in the 90s, we had the very short period of time when the wind of kind of uh, freedom uh, a little bit came to us in Russia, and then it stopped with uh, in 2000, when Putin came to, to power, and gradually it's uh, clumping down and down and down, especially in 2012, when the uh, uh, Balotnaya uh, happened, and then in 2014, the Crimea, and the wars came in 2020, when the laws were rewritten for Putin to stay in po power forever. And uh, all my friends that are there, I'm going back and forth all the time, and um, I mean, my friends there telling me, and I am witnessing it myself, that there is no, f right now, we can't see any future for Russia because it's coming back to kind of, a, I don't know, feudal society uh, with corruption and, um, and uh, it's really, really very sad. The censorship came back. It's nothing new for me also, and uh, self-censorship. And uh, um, for a while, I was showing my, uh, my artwork there with, uh, in, within the museums and stuff, but the last um, example of censorship came in uh, 2019 with, uh, when Pushkin Museum, one of the leading muse uh, Moscow museums, organized an exhibit within the uh, Venice Biennale uh, in 2000. Uh, 19, and I had a part in this uh, church of San Fantin, and uh, I'm, there were only four artists. Gary Hill, the American artist, was there. Uh, Vedova, um, uh, Emilio Vedova, who is uh, passed away. It's a great Italian artist. And uh, uh, two Russian artists, the Krimov guy and myself, were there, and I made the, uh, because it was um, related to the 500th anniversary of uh, Tintoretto there, I made the Tintoretto triptych that was specifically done for for the um, uh, walls of uh, Church of San Fantin. And one of the videos in there was my uh, filming of uh, protests in Moscow in Paris and in London, there uh, pr uh, pr from 1917 and 1918, and it was censored uh, at the very last minute. They said we don't want protests there, and the 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 piece, which is a triptych, was abruptly ruined. Uh, so that's how it is right now, <laughs> right now in Moscow. So where artists are withdrawn to themselves or they have to be put in um, people who are accepted. Or um, if you go to protest, um, you might be imprisoned. So there is, uh, it's a very sad time for Russia right now. Yes, yes. It's nothing new, but people do not uh, learn from their own history. History repeats and repeats and repeats, and uh, it's a sad circle. And um, I don't have a recipe the way out of it unless something drastic <laughs> could happen. Gordon, you've been spending time in that space since 1970, if I recall correctly. That's right. What, what are some of your observations that draw on what Irina has just talked about? And, and as as 
I hope this is this working the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, my first trip to Russia was in 1970. I was an undergraduate student and I was spending a summer language um, period in, in Moscow. And then I went back again in 75, 76 uh, to do my dissertation research. And that was all done mostly in St. Petersburg or at that time, Leningrad. Um, it, it was, it's funny to, well, it's, it's odd, not funny to me to see things go full circle. The, in the seventies, when I was there, um, the artistic intelligentsia were doing essentially what they're doing now. And that is the only place they can show their art is in their own private, um, apartments. Um, they have these, you know, they'll, they'll have a party and, People will show up, and it's very congenial and interesting, but that's the only place they can show their artwork because to be an artist and to be recognized officially as an artist and draw a salary and be hired somewhere and have an official gal um, studio for you and um, supplies provided and all that sort of thing, you have to be coloring within the lines, so to speak, and most of the artists are trying to do experimental things. They were back then. Um, and, um, many of them paid a price for it or they would go underground and you see this dualistic society where people have two faces. Uh, oftentimes they'll have a public face for the authorities. Like I'm a professor of art and I'm doing, I'm teaching art history courses at the university, but then I paint in my apartment at home because, um, they will not provide me with a studio to pr produce the kind of artwork I feel moved to produce. And to be an artist at that time, you had to be in the artist union, which was controlled by the Communist Party, and that entitled you to a salary and to benefits and to vacation resorts and these kind of perks. But then you had to subscribe to the, the restrictions of what... The so, social socialist realm. realism right. was sort of the doctrine of of the day, and so they were dictating how you could do your art. Um, in 1976, when I was there through that entire year, um, the first um, show of avant quote unquote avant garde artist was held yeah. in in Leningrad. And, um, you know, they didn't advertise it at all, but it was all a buzz. All the academic community of St. Petersburg were dying to go see the show of these edgy, young, um, avant-garde artists. Abstract. Uh, abstract artists. <laughs> right. Um, and no so, <clears throat> so we, we went to, to see it, uh, got the, and it was way on the outskirts of St. Petersburg or Leningrad in kind of a working class neighborhood in a consumal communist youth league palace and got there with no advertising. The line to get in was two blocks long. The place was swarmed by KGB officers because everybody else was dressed like Absolutely. in hippie, hippie clothing of the day, you know, and the KGB guys were all there and they're, you know. Suits and ties and looking very, you know, short haircuts and look, you know, looking very obvious and talking into their sleeves, um, into the microphone. <clears throat> but well, I was wondering. Maybe I made, maybe I made that up. Um, <laughs> anyway, when you when we went in and saw the artwork, yeah, the artwork was not like anything we would see in the in the major uh, the major museums. But it wasn't like what we're seeing downstairs. What was downstairs was being produced by some of the same people at that time. But that particular artwork, when I first saw the show downstairs, I was astonished at how openly and blatantly and kind of in kind of a lampoonish way was political. I mean, it was really, and it had a sense of humor about it, for one thing. And that's one thing that the Soviet authorities never had was a sense of humor. Um, but, but the artwork was abstract and some of it was just geometric and impressionistic and all of that, which was edgy as far as the authorities were concerned. But still, there was another layer of artwork that was beyond the pale. And some of the art, the 
artists represented downstairs probably had some pieces in this show. I I know that um, was it Komar, the Komar and Malamid, right? Komar and Malamid. I think Komar was involved with the Bulldozer Show, wasn't he? They had a yeah, both of them were involved in. This. Yeah, there, you know, two years earlier in '74, there had been a, a spontaneous show by artists uh, where they just took over an empty lot and set up their their displays of their artwork with no authority, no nothing, and uh, all the KGB and the police came in and they bulldozed, bulldozed it with a big bulldozer. May I add something yeah, sure. to this effect? I was very young at that time. Um, in 74, I was 19 years old. And um, I was also uh, had to be a part of this show because my older friend told me about it. And actually, it was organized in some ways. Um, one of the artists, Oscar Robin and Talishkin, was organizing that. So, and... Uh, Somehow, KGB was involved for sure because four KGB people came to my parents because my my mother, uh, my father was a uh, university professor, Moscow University professor, and my mother uh, worked at the publishing house uh, for children books. So they came when I was not there at home, and they told them about this show, and they said that you will have big problems at your work if your daughter will participate in this. And what my parents did, they were hysterical, and they said that you can't do this, and they sent me somewhere out to, uh, to our dacha outside of Moscow, and I never participated in this. I regret it, of course, because it was a very historical um, event at that time. But on the other hand, I, I had to obey my parents. If they will be expel expelled from their work, and they were directly threatened at that time. This avant-garde show... In St. Peter and Leningrad, um, all the works had to be screened anyway. So although some of the names were the same names that we see in the current exhibition here, um, all of the, the works individually had to be screened by the KGB and the party authorities before they would let it, even in this avant-garde, yes. um, edgy, new age show that they, they were putting on. So... In Russia, there's nothing that's just on the surface. There's like three levels of, of trying to understand almost everything, politically, uh, socially, uh, socially, legally. You have to uh, read in between the lines how we all learned to do it in Soviet Russia. Because, for instance, if all of a sudden on TV screen there is a swan lake and Tchaikovsky music, it meant that somebody from a uh, party conked uh, that uh, somebody of the political leaders died. Died. So right. that was a very easy Wonder stuff to do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> or something like that. Elena, I wonder uh, whether you want to make observations either on your life experience or maybe some of the research that you've done dating back, uh, focus on the Stalin era. Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Yes, uh, actually, at USC, I teach uh, uh, Russian history, right? And this semester, I teach two courses, Modern Russia, that goes until the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the collapse of the Soviet Union that goes to the present day um, uh, in uh, uh, Putin's um, presidency. Every time when I talk about the 1970s and uh, the 1980s, when I was a student at Moscow University uh, and then a graduate student at Moscow University Department of History, I have a dilemma because uh, from like an ordinary uh, uh, person's point of view, um, if you were not involved with the, the dissident movement, politics, if your parents did not talk about politics at home like in my family, life was, seemed very comfortable. Right. And I have very good memories about the 70s, my student years, and uh, um, uh, the uh, early 80s, 
my, my years at the graduate school. Um, if you look, uh, you see that the state was very uh, paternalistic. Uh, no uh, uh, open unemployment. Uh, uh, inflation was not high because the state controlled the prices, right? So you could not be really fired even if you won, was an alcoholic and um, missed days at work. So um, it was uh, life was very comfortable. So when I uh, teach this period of time, I have kind of to you to show this different um, uh, impression of life of that time. One impression of me being a student uh, at Moscow University in the 70s, early 80s, um, that was, and I was very apolitical at that time, and as a scholar who I became with time and who studied um, uh, uh, Soviet history. Um, uh, and from this study, I realized how, um, uh, what, uh, what problems existed, why the system became stagnant economically, politically, right? So um, uh, this dilemma exists for me as a professor, right? Uh, so I tried to show this both, both sides of, of, of the life in the Soviet Union. So uh, from uh, since I'm not an artist and uh, I can't draw, <laughs> uh, so, but I'm a historian. So my, when I was listening to Irina and Gordon, I was uh, thinking about what it was like to be a historian, not an artist, but a historian in the 70s and 80s, right? So um, as uh, um, Joel already said, in those uh, years, although your life socially and economically was rather comfortable, right? Um, whatever you had in savings, you wouldn't lose it. Whatever you saved for your retirement. Uh, so very, very um, good social programs like um, uh, maternity leaves paid by the state, rather big vacations, like a month vacation. So, uh, however, in order to have this pretty comfortable uh, social life, you have to sacrifice your freedom. And from a point of view of a historian, it meant that if you wanted to be really a scholar, to have access to the archives, to be able to say what you want to say, to publish what you want to publish, you had to go back in history to the 18th century, to the 19th century, the, those areas that were, that were not as much politicized and ideal, idealized. So that's why uh, when I was at the graduate school and I had to decide what to study, I decided to go with imperial history. I realized, I understood that, yeah, I was interested in the 1930s, Stalin's time, but I knew that I would not get access to the archival documents. I, even if some by some miracle I will get this access, I will not be able to publish what I want to publish, right? So that's why my first dissertation was on Imperial Russia. Although there were some topics and taboos there that, for example, the level of development of capitalism that defined um, uh, the, the reasons for the October Revolution, also a very risky topic for the historians that they had to, to avoid. Right. So for a historian at that time, it meant that you had really, if you wanted to be um, a scholar, a true scholar, then you had to choose the this, this certain areas in history that uh, are not that directly connected to politics and ideology. Right. So I can say that I was very, very lucky, very fortunate, because... Um, um, by the time when uh, I entered this age of professional maturity, when I had to write my own work, the archives opened. Right? I defended my dissertation, first dissertation in 1987, and that was exactly the time of Gorbachev's perestroika, the archival revolution. So in other words, uh, I didn't have enough time to write something bad. <laughs> <laughs> that I would be ashamed with later on. I did not need to cite the decisions of the party congresses and make references to Marx's work, Engels' work, Lenin's work. So um, uh, um, the fact that I was relatively young and my, uh, uh, my studies pretty much fell at the end um, of the Soviet rule, um, helped me a lot. And by the time when I became a professional historian, the archives opened and I received this opportunity actually to study what I wanted to study. 
and uh, to receive the access to the archival documents, to write about social and economic history of Stalinism, about how people really lived at that time and survived that time. So I, I will um, just to conclude, my point here is that for a relatively comfortable social life, in paternalistic attitude from the state, you had to sacrifice your professional freedom. Right, you had to kind of to um, uh, to limit uh, or to to end your desires and your professional ambitions in order to actually to try to become professional um, um, uh, under that system. So, and I'm, as I said, I'm very happy that I did not need to sacrifice much and um, was able to take advantage of the archival revolution and uh, did research on Stalinism. May I add a little bit or intercept with what Elena said? Um, first of all, we're both Moscovites. And Moscow is a different thing that the whole Russia, right? It always was a Potemkin village in some ways. And the comfortable life, let's say, of course you have to be complicit. As now, you have to be complicit to have all the goodies, right? So in that time, everybody was poor, but nobody uh, starved. So in th this relatively good life is uh, meant that uh, you are not starving. So you could do have your profession if you are complicit. If you uh, you don't have like a researcher <laughs> out of the uh, realm of possibilities, and uh, then you you really like. For instance, I have to say about the artists, right? All these artists who re represented in this show, uh, most of them lived a very comfortable life, but not because they were doing their, they, uh, what they were doing was never shown or never seen, but because they were, uh, including me, <laughs> we were children book illustrators, and it's the only field that was apolitical, and you can really uh, do more or less what you want, except of the faces of children or uh, or animals, whatever, have to be happy and nice. <laughs> At some point, it was too much. <laughs> but but uh, this kind of a job was really well paid. And uh, as, uh, you, you could make a book or two uh, a year and... Uh, it probably took one or two months. For instance, like Kabakov and uh, Bulatov and every, like a lot of artists was earning uh, uh, money for doing children book illustrations. And you have a lot of time that you could work on your own stuff, right? So one or two months a year, you do children book illustrations and the rest of the year you work um, on your own, on your own stuff. So in this way, because everybody was poor, so it was possible to live a decent life and um, do what you want. And also, because we are saying Russia, Russia is horrible, Russia is this and this and this, in Soviet times, what was good, it was friendship, because we really survived through our friends. And art is actually was because you know that you are not involved in any kind of uh, exhibitions, not with museums. The artists who really worked at that time, they worked for themselves, for art for art's sake, to, be, uh, to survive as human beings, because through art you survive mm. as human beings. And because money were not involved in that activity, it was it was good. It was sincere. It was great, and uh, a lot of people uh, art not a lot. Some people who <laughs> who are still alive from that generation really believe in uh, art as a survival for for humanities, and it's true because it's all about freedom. So freedom in your kitchen, let's say. 
unfortunately. This all sounds very heavy. And I want, I want to throw in that, at least in my experience, the artists and the writers and the various members of the intelligentsia also had great senses of humor. Um, it was maybe a bitter humor because of what they were living through. Um, but Through great I, parties. <laughs> through, through great parties. <clears throat> I love the title of this show, of the ironic curtain, because irony... Irony was a big part of their their humor because they were living this kind of dualistic, structured life in their in their professions. If that's what they were doing, uh, I noticed a lot of the or some of the artists and photographers photography sh uh, pieces downstairs <clears throat> were um, done by professional photographers who were gainfully employed by the state. But those particular images were not being shown at the time because they were too edgy, but they were being shown privately. But Russians have a wicked sense of humor. One of my favorite books by a, a Russian immigre to Israel was Gary Steingart. I don't know if you know Absurdistan. Um, it's, a, it's a great send-up of, of the former Soviet Union where everything's absurd. <clears throat> takes place in a city called Ibansk, which uh, is kind of edgy, but it translates as sort of suck town or fuck town or uh, fuck up you uh, or Columbia or fuck up in you. Anyway, uh, but, but, you know, they, they would get together in their apartments after, you know, at the end of the day or on weekends and drink and laugh and carry on. And um, I think some of the sense of humor comes through the art work we see downstairs as well. It's both a parody and it's deadly serious on one level, but on another level, it's funny. It's, it's, and that's why the authorities found it so offensive is because the last thing the Communist Party officials would tolerate was somebody laughing at them, making fun of them. That was... That's the worst. <laughs> that's the worst possible thing that they can do. But the Russians have a great sense of humor. And I think that that has helped carry them through a lot of bad times. That's true. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, actually, um, I'm listening to Irina and Gordon and becoming more and more nostalgic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, one of the things of that time, um, like a, a phenomenon that we had a lot of free time. Uh, People really could not travel outside of the Soviet Union. They could travel within the Soviet Union, but not outside. Uh, uh, our economic activities were very limited because the state did not allow people to become wealthy, right? So you could get your wealth only from the state. And as Irina said, the society was socially leveled. Right? There was an internal hierarchy, of course, but the gap, be uh, uh, the gap between the classes, between the social groups, were not that big. So, uh, so not uh, a lot of free time and not much to do. So, uh, we being students, graduate students, the young uh, uh, intelligence, we spent a lot of time together, just uh, having um, parties, talking all nights in our in our small kitchens discussing music literature books uh, uh movies making uh, anecdotes jokes about the political leader so that's sort of the kitchen culture right mm -hmm. so this culture this sort of um time um or experience disappeared with the development with the beginning of capitalism in russia Right. So when all these opportunities opened for people, that uh, people could um, could explore different opportunities, economic opportunities, travel opportunities, to make more money, to travel abroad, it became impossible to get together. Uh, so it was not possible now to to get a big group of of your friends uh, and colleagues to spend the night in the kitchen talking because everyone became became just a uh, business busy doing money traveling right exploring all these new opportunities so this part of that life life was sure. lost right the, uh, the life became more materially oriented less i would say uh, not not spiritually in the re religious uh, 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 way, but meaning that you discuss 
not material things. You discuss uh, um, uh, cultural issues. Uh, uh, so, and um, I missed that part of that life. When life changed uh, in, um, in Soviet Russia, in Russia, then um, uh, um, th this time of time spinning, I don't know, this style uh, disappeared. I don't know if you would agree with that. I agree, absolutely. I agree with that. And I don't know if our audience uh, relate to this at all, because it never was like this uh, here in the States. So, for instance, we were very highbrow and uh, uh, snotty about our knowledge of uh, our knowledge. Knowledge was the most important thing to have. So literature, right? Your knowledge is the most important thing, not money. Money was not, <laughs> was not an issue at any time. So that's why the education was so important. And people did read a lot and listened to music a lot. And uh, like uh, Elena said, films and whatever. And, uh, and the education was incomparable, especially with people who really um, studied and um, by themselves. But um, it's all gone. Old Russian intelligentsia is dead. Like I, when I go to Moscow right now, I see young people who don't relate to this culture at all. They don't know what I'm talking about. So, and uh, it's all gone, and uh, unfortunately. So. Well, let me say, I mean, I think as, as one who was the last into the space, and 1987 was the first time I was there, 1998 was the last time I was there. I was so heartbroken uh -huh. in 1998, I haven't been able to return for exactly what you're describing. When I first went as a 16 or 17 year old, and then when I was there mostly in the early 90s, what I was struck by was everybody, doesn't matter what station of life, everybody had read Dostoevsky, had read Tolstoy, had read Pushkin. Yes. Everyone was warm. Everyone was warm from the first day I arrived in 1987, Iron Curtain, all the things, uh, wanted to know about the United States, wanted to know about wh what our lives were like, wanted to connect in very real, very intimate ways. And by 1994, 1993, four, five, you were starting to see a shift. The materialism was coming out. I, I like to say that Russia took on the worst aspects of capitalist society and none of the best and lost all of the good things along the way. It was heartbreaking to watch. And then in 98, when I was there, I almost, I really, like I found myself not going out. I really couldn't do it. And, and I think back, you know, I, I was talking to, I, I, on that first 87, I was there on an exchange and in 93, when I was there on the, on the Moscow ring road, the equivalent of sort of, I guess a beltway, it, it, the early day Uber existed, except you didn't hail, you didn't call the ride. You just stuck your hand out and cars would pull over and they'd roll down their window and you'd say, here's where I'm going. And they'd sort of name a price and you'd say, you'd haggle a bit and you, and you'd get in the front seat and you'd start talking. And some of the best nights of my life were with people whose names I can't tell you who drove me home or, and, and came up and we had, we, we drank and we hung out and we just talked through the night for a whole night. And, um, and I held my hand out one night and this guy pulled over and it was the guy whose family I'd lived with you know, five years earlier, six years earlier, has become one of my best friends in the world. And, and it was this connected, important, relevant experience. And, and, and you feel that loss, you feel the loss because even though there was this dualism, there was this very connected aspect. And so now we have this new period and um, so much of the government interference and the fear that comes from that so I guess I wonder if, if you could, both having been there this summer, maybe Irina and Elena tell us what, what kinds of things might give us some hope. What, are, are there some, some features of, of life day to day or some aspects beyond the Putin piece? But I mean, in terms of how people connect or the role of art or whatever it may be that we can, we can look positively at. This summer is ex exceptionally bad, I would say, with covid with fear, with clump on all the protests and the new rules and stuff. That was exceptionally bad, I, was, I would say, this time. But uh, there are still people who, um, 
resist. There are a very few uh, media outlets that still exist, like Echo Moscow, Radio Moscow. Um, but they are all... Uh, Dorsch there, but so he, he was just the, the uh, foreign, foreign agent. agent, and I don't know how long it it could be possible for them to broadcast. The other media is um, uh, uh, Drugoya Vremya. Uh, no, what is it? Current Times. No, Current Times. It's a, it's a Current Times uh, TV, but it's uh, much smaller. And there are journalists who try to um, resist, but more and more um, journalists are uh, named for an agent. And um, I don't know how long it will sustain this way because... It's it's getting worse, I would say. Well, and I mentioned last night when we were together, the journalist I worked for in the summer of 1993, Yurishi Kachichin, was murdered was in killed. 2002. Yeah, who was killed. Uh, and he was, at the period when Anna Politovskaya very famously was murdered, he was one uh -huh. of a number. And in fact, at the time, he was serving in the Duma for Putin's party, but uh, but he he had become he, he had always been outspoken. He'd always been independent. He worked with both the equivalent of the FBI, the MVD, and organized crime groups in, in in telling the stories of what was happening. And both sides trusted him, knew that he would be that he would maintain their confidences. But it's that period of sort of silencing journalists in the early two thousands that happened very obviously, and then now in different ways, foreign agents. Uh, other activities of various yeah. kinds. You know, this is kind of history repeating itself. Um, remember back in 1974, the Soviet government under Brezhnev forced, um, um, oh shoot, uh, uh, the writer from um, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. You mean Solzhenitsyn? Yeah, Solzhenitsyn. Uh, uh -huh. Solzhenitsyn out of the country. They forced him to immigrate. Um, and the, I, the thinking of the leadership was this guy is stirring up trouble in the country. Let's send him abroad. But it's this kind of very cynical idea about it that he'll get to the West and he will lose all traction after a year or two. And sure enough, like three years later, uh, Solzhenitsyn gives the uh, commencement address at Harvard. Uh, and it's a it's a denunciation of American culture for being without substance and being all show and, and no no substance and really a pretty biting critique. And I think that the Putin who was alive and well and around at that time has, has learned or learned the lesson that one way we silence these people is we. We force them out of the country and they lose their cultural contact with their homeland and with people and they get lost in the media circus that exists in Western society and pretty soon they will become cynical about our society and start offering critiques of it and that will burn a bridge and, and so we don't have to worry about them. We, so we can, you know, Putin's doing this right now, offering various people that are thorns in his side. Do you want to go to prison in Siberia or do you want an exit visa? And there is a, yeah, there is a mass exodus from Russia. Maybe you saw this New York Times article a few days ago about this uh, thing. And uh, yeah, you go to prison or you, sh you, you are silent <laughs> or you go away. <laughs> So they don't want any uh, people criticizing them. They want to have free hand for um, whatever. Whatever. It's a mafia society in a large way. And Having worked uh, with organized crime in the 1990s, I would say actually the mafia society was actually far more inclusive in certain ways and provided certain protections. That's so, true. I'm quite serious, yeah. That's, that's I mean, true. It, it had a very important organizing now function in the early yeah, 90s. Now it's a state mafia. So, yeah. And of course they want their hands free. Um, Elena? But yeah. 
yeah, I want just to uh, to make a like a, maybe a short comment. I was in Russia this summer. I spent two months uh, in Russia, in Moscow, Saint Petersburg. I gave a talk in Kazan, the Tatar Republic, and also I went to the archaeological excavations near Smolensk. Of course, we all have our own Russia, our friends, family, right? The places that, that we love, um, the museums, the archives, theaters. So this is the Russia that, that we love and uh, uh, this is why we go there, right? But uh, I agree with Irina and Gordon that the situation is becoming um, pretty bad. And specifically because in September, uh, there will be the elections to the parliament, right. Duma. And so uh, they, they are preparing for these elections. They are trying to get rid of all the possible alternative candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, are trying to shut down all the sources of um, um, uh, information like uh, 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 right. Uh, right, uh, journalists uh, and the, the channels like Dorst, Echo Moskvi, because through these channels, um, uh, people will receive um, information about the events on the streets, about the events at the um, uh, 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 election uh, polls, right? So they're preparing for, for the elections in September, and um, the policy is especially strict right now. You, um, uh, as, as Irina and Gordon said, that they uh, pretty much uh, to make people leave the country, and we see how people who were close to Navalny are leaving uh, right. are leaving country. Navalny, who who could be one of the alternative candidates, now is in prison. Um, other people are proclaimed to be crazy, like that shaman uh, exactly. from from Siberia who was uh, going to um, to Moscow to get rid of Putin to make Putin leave. Again, uh, he's in the um, mental asylum, right? And um, um, he's going through that forced treatment, right? Medical treatment. So we can see all this spectrum of the KGB methods in which Putin was trained, right? And we see how they are trying to prevent um, um, uh, any, uh, any, uh, any, uh, any, surprises, unpleasant surprises for them to happen during during uh, those elections um, uh, to the parliament, mm -hmm. right? And uh, honestly, I don't see any hope uh, at this moment because um, people are silent. And with, um, with uh, the sources, very limited sources of information, um, uh, uh, the, the, the authorities will uh, pretty much re reproduce the same um, um, ideas, the same mentality. We need people who think differently, but to think differently, they need sources of information that are different from the from the official TV and official radio station. And these sources, are, if these sources of information are limited or do not exist, then there is no way that uh, people's mentality. Um, uh, uh, their worldview will change, right? And so this is this is where I see the major problem right now. Right. Even people have computers, and if they want, they could browse and they look could look for information. But if the womb, uh, I mean the t TV is twenty four hours uh, brainwashing them, so. Who would go and look for alternatives? Very little, uh, very few people, and ev even young people. So they want good job within the society. They know whatever, and they comply. And even uh, young people, they don't uh, browse on their computers for look for the alternative information. Uh, and who does? They want to exit that country. Uh, I'm looking at young people here and probably they are thinking, what, what those guys are talking about? It's an imaginary country. It can't exist like that. But they, they do, <laughs> it does exist, unfortunately. And, um, it's hard to, hard to imagine. If I would be like somebody who would 
tell me about North Korea and those all those marches and fantastic parades and this and this. Of course, I do. I did see some uh, brave documentary makers who who made those things to for us visualize and to see that it does exist. But if you just listen to it, it's unimaginable. It's a uh, Absurdistan, like uh, <laughs> Gordon said, it's crazy. Yeah. But it's going that way, unfortunately, right now. Well, and if you think about it, when we talk about the repeat of history, you think about the period in the 70s and 80s, what we're talking about with the media was the case then, except that it was the state controlling. So we knew that was the rule of the game. Mm -hmm. It's this sort of part of the heartbreak is the period of the 90s where there was this openness and this period and this moment, and then the retrenchment away from that. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the complicit role of the United States in a lot of this, and particularly in the 1990s during privatization and the and the um, various experts from the United States who came in and, and oversaw a process that that pro privatized into the hands of a very few and created. I mean, the oligarchs were created by a process. That process was created by experts from Harvard and and uh, LSE and other places who who built a system that created the modern day oligarchies. Uh, but how do you do in such an abrupt and short way? So it's hard. Like many people criticize Biden for take, withdrawing from Afghanistan this abruptly, and so many people died there because of this. But I can't see the exit from the twenty years war uh, not to have casualties in this way. How do you finish the regime that uh, was? there for 70 years without any kind of casualties. But unfortunately, it didn't go that far. So it's it's collapsed, and now we are in this situation where the dictatorship in full swing, so to speak. Yeah, I, I was. I'm going to take. I'm going to divert us for a second, and then bring us back. But I'll say that one of, one of the things that was striking to me during that period was there were two parallel constitution making processes happen happening at exactly the same time, both from totalitarian states to theoretically democratic ones, Russia and South Africa happening at exactly the same moment in history. And I'm still fascinated to this day that no one's ever. This was going to be my doctoral dissertation for the PhD. I never did, but it never. No one's ever written about this because they took very different approaches to. Ha to how they wrote their constitutions. The, the, the documents themselves are also extraordinarily different. The modern South African constitution is one of the most progressive in the world. Um, the Russian one, even before its amendments, we wouldn't say that about. Uh, and, and, and yet, both very different paths, both sadly have returned to heavily corrupt states, heavy government involvement. I mean, there's the, the stories seem to end in the same places, even though we saw divergent paths. And I think there was hope there might be a different story written you know, in one than the other. Let, let, yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I'd like to open the floor. We have about 20 minutes left and we want to have an opportunity for any questions. I don't know, what's our process for passing the mic as it were? Do we have a, well, I'm happy to pass mine if we have a, um, a wipe or something. Yeah. Perfect. If you want to, Pass this, Susan. I think has a question. I've, this was so fascinating. I've been holding on to this question for a long time, but the discussion sort of um, reinforces my interest in it because, uh, Gordon, you said early on that I wanted to bring it back to art. <laughs> you said you said that that what's that now. The same thing is going on as then, which is that artists are mainly only showing privately in their own apartments. And I couldn't tell when you segue from now to then, but it sounded like you were saying that there is there's an official art and that there's no there's not even a sort of capitalist pretense of of openness. But I, I couldn't I really couldn't tell. I'm so sorry if I gave you that impression. Things have really changed a lot since the 1970s where there was. Official art, which is sort of, you know, propagandistic art. And then gradually um, people were doing things on the side. If it was, even if it was moderately as outside, they would do it privately. Now, they have much more 
freedom to be able to do things in their own homes, not necessarily paid by the government. If they are in the artist union and, and are drawing a salary from the state and teaching courses and things like that, um, they're under censorship. Uh, uh, you know what? If, if it's politics, then it might be censored or self-censored right. because people know what's going on around. So it's um, more of a self-censorship. And if you want to show something more edgy and political, then um, the state could interfere. But there are many venues in Russia right now, right. in Moscow at least. There are private galleries that they are not bound by the state. Of course, they they also sometimes censor because there are a lot of like uh, so called state activism, Rosgvardia. I don't know how to translate it. The people like religious group and uh, uh, state inclined group, they they do go to shows, and if they don't like it, they could, uh, it's a, in a, a few times, the exhibits were sacked uh, because of this by, by those uh, pro-government groups. And they could uh, sue you for, like, re re that they were um, offended as a religious person. <laughs> so they are all kind of pretty. Like like yeah. in Texas, if you if right, you right, absolutely, or, or whatnot. But but still, of of course, there is much more open in this way. And the museums, of course, they they show uh, the art of the twenties and thirties and uh, uh, abstract art and this and this. But it goes uh, towards more decorative art with no edge and uh, more Russian-oriented art. I, I called it Russian Kalabashin, whatever it is, like Matryoshka or something. And uh, it's sad because uh, the art that is relevant to a uh, current situation, what's there. Look, if you reflect on what's going on there, so most likely you you won't be able to show. Uh, uh, exactly, Pussy rights. There some left the country. Some are under certain restrictions. Yeah. Uh, charged and, with criminal offenses. Charged, cri yeah, criminal in intent or whatnot. So uh, you know. Back in, Pavlensky, in the day, people Pavlensky, would, for instance, in the in the publishing area, um, authors would say, "We're writing for the drawer. We don't intend to publish this Doctor Zhivago or Cancer Ward or or whatever in the country because that's probably a bridge too far." But I will circulate a personally typed manuscript of it, and those things would go through hundreds of readers. I mean, the. It, you would get it when it was finally your turn in the in the queue to get that that um, that copy of it, and it would be nearly falling apart. Some of that's still going on today, and it's going on in art as well. In that they will uh, paint or sculpt or do work privately, not maybe try to sell it if it has a political edge of where they know they're going to get in trouble, and they can try to find ways to get it out of the country. That's one thing that they can export some of their artistic work. But in a way, it's going back to writing for the drawer again, uh, because this is not going to get through this, the censors. Um, but it tells us something that the artwork we saw downstairs has gotten out and is being viewed. What is funny that literature is the least censored uh, stuff. Like, for instance, uh, Vladimir Sarokin, who is one of the most prominent Russian art uh, writers right now, his books are still uh, available. They are published. And maybe because there are only limited copies of it right. and people don't know how to read anymore. <laughs> so uh, so the, the more says. Uh, censored are, for instance, uh, theater performances. Theaters are censored. Uh, 
uh, movies are censored, visual art, because you don't have to read, right? <laughs> and uh, um, I used to say that Russian culture is a verbal culture, but I guess not anymore, uh, because it's less and less people are reading. I think we have to mention humor here at some point, because one thing that really holds Russia together and the intelligentsia together is abiding humor. It may be dark humor, but it's humor. And they get together and they tell jokes, they tell stories. It usually has a dark tinge to it. Um, but um, this shows up in their artwork. It shows up in their literature. It shows up in their daily lives. And they get, they'll get together with a bottle of vodka and some salami around the kitchen table and have a good time. And life is good for them in, in lots of ways. I mean, there's joy in life, um, but it's kind of a bitter joy, too. Yeah, just a, um, a very brief remark. Um, uh, just to make sure that there is a lot of artistic freedom in Russia still in, um, in our days. And you can see all different types of art. Right. For example, in Moscow, there is a small um, uh, museum called AZ, as uh, named after Andrei Zverev, who belongs yes. actually to this cohort of the artists. Uh, it, when I was in St. Petersburg, I could go to an exhibition to see Warhol uh, works and uh, the the Russian followers of him or imitators of, of his style. So um, there are private museums and the state museums. However, the censorship is back. And uh, it uh, becomes uh, uh, more strict. Um, uh, and as a matter of fact, in literature and in art, for example, just recently, the certain committees were formed that pretty much looked how the historical events of, of politics is presented. It's prohibited, for example, to compare Stalin with Hitler now yes. and to compare the Soviet Union and Hitler's uh, um, uh, Nazi Germany, right? So, uh, 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 for example, it's prohibited to say something bad about Soviet participation in the Second World War to show those negative, um, um, uh, uh, so, so pages, black pages of this. So, uh, like, there was just recently a case about the, um, like a, a theater play that you cannot say anything bad about the veterans of the war. Right. So, um, uh, so the censorship exists and it becomes uh, more strict. And now, um, uh, I will go back to history. Historians, when they write, right, about the 20th century, they have to go through self-censorship because they already know that they cannot do it. Like the artists, for example, can't present, um, like an artwork where they will put it's swastika, the Nazi symbol, with with the red star. So it's prohibited now, um, uh, according to to the to existing censorship, right? So uh, we can see this um, trend, in, mm -hmm. in, we, we can see the direction in which it's going. I would say that during Gorbachev's perestroika and Yeltsin's rule, um, the amount of freedom that the society received was so enormous. Sometimes very close to anarchy, really, like the absolute freedom, right? So that this, um, in our days, we still have a um, rather big amount of this freedom. Right? So we can see, we can see how this um, area uh, is becoming narrower and narrower. But because the society was able to grab so much, during Gorbachev's reforms and Yeltsin's time, that's still where we have um, uh, some space for different opinions um, in, in art, for example, or in history. But as I said, it's becoming narrower and narrower. What is it Elena is talking about is very poignant because um, Putin deems himself uh, a great historian. And also he is building uh, an empire. So rewriting the history once again, and some, some points are prohibited. So as Elena uh, pointed out, so uh, you can't touch Stalin. For instance, a few days again, uh, again uh, uh, a few days 
ago, um, uh, Lavrov, who is the uh, foreign minister, he uh, talked about Stalin one uh, again, like uh, that Stalin, in his opinion, not his opinion, probably it's state opinion. So you cannot uh, talk about Second World War and uh, uh, compare him to Hitler and that you can't touch Stalin because he won the war. And that's what uh, Russians dwell on and uh, they, it supports this kind of imperial history that he's uh, gradually building uh, and building on, unfortunately. We are talking about very specific things, so maybe it's so far away from everybody's. Uh, well, actually, if I don't see questions, I, I wonder if, if we could slide forward two slides to the piece rooms. If you could talk a little bit about that piece, that installation piece. Oh, uh, those rooms were made in my apartment that I still have in Moscow, and when I go there, I stay there. So, and those pieces are made in the uh, early and mid 80s. So when it was the gloomiest time of Brezhnev's era and uh, nobody thought that Perestroika is coming just in a few years ahead. And uh, I uh, was, everybody was depressed uh, and uh, it was gloomy uh, winter cold gray winter in 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 moscow and i said that i have to do something about uh where i stay and i took everything from one of my i had the two rooms apartment took everything out of one room it was my studio at that time and uh, i started building this environment uh, maybe it's a uh, like uh, I didn't know the word installation at <laughs> that time, but I had to create something for myself completely different because I can't travel, I can't do much. Uh, I am a ruler only of my apartment, right? So, and um, I created this uh, installation, and I didn't know if, at the time that it would would be so cr crucial and innovative for Russian art history. Now they talk about this, but at that time it was just one, my, uh, my room, four by four meters. I don't know, it's like uh, in, uh, I still think in meters and centimeters rather than in uh, food. So, and it was done with very simple means uh, of paper and cutouts and, um, it was completely different. So in some ways I was traveling in the environment that I made uh, in my apartment. And I probably worked on this about a month or two and then because lives go on, it existed for a couple of weeks. My friends saw it and then it all ended up in the garbage. So, <laughs> and it exists only in, um, documentation in, in uh, these photographs. We didn't even have uh, uh, video cameras at that time, so um, we don't have good... Uh, uh, room number two was done in 1984, a year later. Also because of desperation, I wanted... Uh, once you start working on a larger scale, it's really... Um, uh, haunts you and it asks for uh, this. So uh, a year later, uh, just with, a, again, very simple means, uh, was paper and black and gray and white paper. I made another room and it looked like uh, something exploded there. Room number three, uh, a, la a year later, uh, I called it painted light. It was just one... <clears throat> Uh, lamp, uh, source of light in the room. I didn't take everything out and it was painted, 
according to that light. And the light faces the uh, door, uh, balcony door. When you open, maybe the next slide, please. please. Oh, this is a recreation in Zimmerli Art Museum. This room number three, it exists right uh, in, uh, uh, was recreated for an exhibit um, in 19, uh, what I'm saying, in 2018. Jane Sharp was the curator there. So, and uh, it was recreated in ideal way how I thought it should be but uh, at uh, in 1985 when it was done we didn't have the means to print it that uh, pristinely uh, so uh, and that is one of the last rooms uh, that was conceived in my apartment and uh, was uh, but was realized in first time in the west in 1988 it was one of the first exhibits for uh, russian art uh, in west berlin and that was an initiative uh, of, uh, with um, german artists that invited privately at that time you couldn't go abroad without private invitation like seven uh west berlin artists it was still an island it was still west berlin uh invited seven uh moscow artists and we worked there for three months and uh, one of the rooms were realized there so it was an exciting time when this breath, uh, breath of fresh air <laughs> came to Russia, and then uh, in just 10 years, it was over, unfortunately. I think talking about that, those pieces is kind of a perfect way to end this evening's conversation. So please join me in thanking all three, but especially Irina for, for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, bringing me here. I enjoyed my stay here very much, and I hope it was interesting <laughs> for you what we were talking about. Not well, that we hope, remote. We hope to bring you back again. I hope everyone's had a Thank chance to so visit much. the exhibit, and maybe can visit again in light of tonight's conversation and with a different eye uh, to it when you do so. And look forward to many more programs uh, here at the museum uh, with the college and other participants. So thank you again very much everybody from the museum and, and from, from the university yeah. who's been part of this. And thank, thank you again, you, Irina. Thank, thank you, all. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.